Hi, my name is Tony Rivera. I'm the Managing Director of Azure Minerals. Azure has a very exciting lithium project in the West Pilbara region of Western Australia, and it's going from strength to strength. And not only is the project looking good, but our share price is as well. Tony, thanks for the introduction. I noticed the shift in presentation style. Uh, you've got a lithium project, whereas uh, up until now you've been a battery metals company with nickel and cobalt and copper as well. I, I know the lithium is going gangbusters. and I know that's where all the excitement is, but it, 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 is that what's, what you are now? Are you a lithium company? I think we have to be focused on the lithium. The market is telling us that that's what they really like. Um, we, we've had the project for three years now. And in that period of time, you know, we've made two good nickel sulphide discoveries uh, and we've completed a scoping study. But basically, the market said, ho-hum, that's a little bit boring. Uh, so a, a year or so, a year and a half ago, we started exploring f for uh, or testing the pegmatites that were very obvious out there on the property. And uh, I discovered that there was a lot of these pegmatites in outcrop hosted very large amounts of visible spodumene. And when we assayed them, though, we got high grades of lithium came back. As soon as we started informing the market of this, uh, the uh, the market took a great, it was a very positive reaction to it. And uh, I think that's telling us a very strong message is uh, Azure Minerals, stick to your lithium. Good. Well, I hope you don't change the name because by, by being called Azure Minerals, you were able to move from nickel to lithium in a very neat segue without having to worry about whether you're what, what your company was called and now yes. please don't change it to uh, Azure Lithium that would just be a, no no uh, we won't be doing that just be a disaster when we spoke uh, I spoke to you in November and uh, you last spoke I think with uh, Matt in February you were talking about getting out there drilling tr um, targeting uh, you, th you said that w success would be uh, line of sight on a kind of a resource that could potentially be 100 million tonnes or greater because there aren't many of these big deposits out there in the world. There are only, I think you mentioned the word num uh, the number nine, of which five are in Western Australia. And um, judging by your share price and by the way the drilling activity and some of the intersections that you've put together, it looks as if you're kind of you're heading that way. That's the kind of that, that's the target you've put in your in your AGM presentation last week. Um, Talk to me about that kind of 100 million tonnes target and, and what you're seeing at the moment. Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, so I can't really call it an exploration target because that's a defined term under the ASX rules. So, but what I can say is that I gra gathered our exploration team together and I asked them to go out into the field to see if they could identify whether the project, whether Andover, ha has the potential to host over 100 million tonnes of lithium resources. And after their initial ex investigations and exploration out there, they've come back and said, yes, they do believe that the project has that potential to host over 100 million tonnes. So hence, we, we started drilling back in, in March with two diamond drill rigs. And uh, now we've got two RC rigs in there as well. And we've got two more rigs arriving next week. And the, the project is, is going uh, head in leaps and bounds. And the, the style of mineralisation, uh, of the lithium mineralisation that's within the it's hosted in the pegmatites um, indicates that there's very broad widths of mineralization. We, the first couple of holes that we released, or two of the first holes that we released results for this week, had mineralization extending over 100 meters, and this is pretty close to true width as well. So, what's what's the dip? What angle are you drilling, and what dip are these things lying? Okay, so obviously they, not obviously, but they do outcrop at surface because there's uh, there's very little vegetation or sand cover or anything there, so they outcrop at surface. Uh, they strike from southwest to northeast and they dip towards the northwest at about, about 40 to 50 degrees. So call it on average 45 degree northwesterly dip. Um, they are they vary in, in true width from maybe 5 to 10 metres in some places to well over 100 metres in thick in other places. Um, and they, they, so as is, is typical with, with a lot of pegmatites, they pinch and swell along the way. But we've certainly intersected a lot of very fat inter in, in intervals of mineralization so you can you drill from the north northwest to the southeast and you can um if you're putting in 50 degree hole are you, are you drilling at 50 degrees or 60 or, you know, what's your preferred yeah 50 or 60 degrees um and and so if we're at 50 degrees we're pretty close to orthogonal or perpendicular to the dip and so a lot of our uh, intersections are very very close to true width and you've got um Two diamond rigs then, two RC rigs. What are the new two rigs coming? Are they going to be diamond or the RC? One of each, another diamond rig and another RC rig. So we have those. Uh, so we have three diamond rigs and three RC rigs all going by the end of June, uh, and then it's just it's full steam ahead as fast as we can to uh, 
to definitely confirm that we have an exploration target of over 100 million tonnes and with the intention of getting a, a mineral resource as soon as we can. Have you got any tips and tricks for defining which ones are the larger pegmatites um, other than their surface expression? No, their surface expression is the main guide to the uh, the potential of each of the pegmatites that we see out there. And, and by surface expression, that is both the length, that's the, that's the breadth of it at surface, but also the, the quantity of um, spodumene that we see within the outcrops and the and the grades that we get return that we re we receive back from the sampling. So that uh, those four things: length, breadth, uh, spodumene content, and, and lithium grade is what defines our prioritisation of of where we go drilling. Um, is, is there a lot of variation in kind of chemical? content or grade or kind of mineralizing style i mean are, are these obviously they formed roughly at the same time as part of the same event but presumably there's a different pulses and different exactly um in in, in intrusions there is indeed there is there is uh we see the um uh, the pegmatites uh, not only that do they pinch and swell at surface but also there's going to be some zones which are highly enriched in in spodumene and others where it's uh yeah, other minerals uh, quartz and feldspar and the like what we do see is, we're, particularly in the drilling, which because it's the the rock is quite fresh and or very fresh, and we can see it quite clearly, is that the highest grade parts of the uh, of the pegmatites, where we get the highest lithium grades, it's really just spodumene and quartz, uh, and then in areas where it's lower grade, you're going to have maybe some feldspars in there, but we see very little in the way of micas, uh, and spodumene is the only significant lithium mineral. We we hardly have seen any lipidolite or petalite, which which is great. I mean, that's yes. kind of what you want. Um, have you done any kind of uh, trace element uh, check assays for deleterious elements? I don't know, fluorine, bismuth, kind of some kind of some of the funnies in there. Yeah, we certainly do a, a wide range of uh, elements which are being analysed for, and so and iron is probably the principal one that uh, that uh, the processes downstream don't like to see. So what we do know is we've got very low iron in in these pegmatites, but also we've get um, low in other deleterious elements as well. Now, having said that, we've not yet started the, uh, or we're not down the track of the metallurgical test work, so we don't know what's going to be in the concentrate. But at least in the in the rock itself, uh, we see very little in the way of deleterious elements. Uh, what's the rough density? Uh, I, I I know it's um, early days, and you can't kind of give a, give a kind of an absolute number. But um, when 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 you think of these pegmatites, do you think kind of 2.7 grams per centimeter cubed, or 2.8, or 2.5, or 2.9? Two for 2.8. It's it's around about two point eight, and the, and the more spodumene you get, the the higher the density. Uh, and if there's no spodumene in there, and it's just quartz and feldspar, it'll be two point five something. And if the and uh, if you get a lot of spodumene, it'll be two point eight something. I find that useful just to uh, have at the back of the mind for any kind of volume calculations to do. It just it it can change tonnages by uh, quite a considerable amount um, if you, if you don't get the the, the right. Uh, density figure. Um, What's your um, dialogue with SQM like? Because um, they are now a twenty percent shareholder. It, um, are, are they on the phone to you? Do they kind of uh, are, are you sharing the data with them? Are, are you allowed to share the data with them, or do they receive it in the same way that um, others do through um, the publishment, the publication of news releases? Yeah. So SQM are a nineteen point nine nine percent shareholder in Azure. And we have a share subscription agreement with them under which there's a whole bunch of different uh, rules that we have to operate up, guidelines which we operate under. Um, one of those is is the data. So we have formed a what's called a technical steering committee, uh, which is two representatives from Azure and one SQM rep on the, on that committee. And then, and those um, technical steering committee meetings are held every quarter, at which point we can uh, inform SQM of all of the... Uh, the happenings that have been going on and also indicate where we're going to be going in the forthcoming quarter. So we, we do tell them a lot of what's happening. In the early days, and I'm talking about back at the beginning of this year, um, that a lot of what we were doing was asking them questions because they were the experts in the room and, and we were learning. But here we are six months later and I, I would have to be say very proudly that our, our exploration geologists have now become real leaders in uh, lithium exploration in pegmatites because uh, we have um, we've had to come up a very steep learning curve, and we've done that. And the guys have, have been very outstanding um, in doing their job. So essentially, they get the they get all of the data once a quarter. No, they don't get all of the data. They get uh, the data that is in the public domain, 
Um, and then we, but we also do a, you know, some answers, question and answer sessions as well. But they, you know, they, they are at the end of the day just a shareholder, so they're entitled to exactly what other shareholders and uh, get as well. But uh, they do have certainly in the early days they had a lot more experience than us, so we pick their brains as much as possible. Where we sit right now is that we know a lot more than them, so it's uh, um, we're, we're comfortable with that position. Aside from the technical um, dialogue. Do you speak to the business development arm of SQM? And are they um, presumably they're happy with the way their investment has gone? Uh, yes, we do speak to them. I do speak to them regularly. Uh, they have to be happy. I think they invested $20 million, which is now worth $100 million. So from, from an investment perspective, they'd be quite happy. But I think they're also absolutely ecstatic about the success that we've been having because they see this as, as uh, Andover as being potentially one of the world's largest lithium deposits. Well, let's let's stick on the technical side. Let's stick on the just kind of on the on the, the, the work plan for the year. Um, you've got a forty thousand meter drill program underway. You, uh, you've got twenty million dollars in cash, I, I think. So, um, is, is that principally it? It's it's uh, d- drill trying to f- define the envelope of mineralization as best you can in the shortest space of time as possible. Yes, it is. Um, we're doing obviously a lot of drilling, so four rigs now, another two, six rigs by the beginning of July, and and it's drill, drill, drill. Uh, we're, we've got one particular area we're drilling in at the moment, which is about two kilometres long, with four or five pegmatites parallel to each other within a, a corridor, um, and then uh, we we are currently undertaking some heritage surveys. Uh, once we get clearance from those surveys, we'll be stepping the drilling out. Um, and we'll have uh, be drilling two new areas, which are just as exciting as the one we're currently drilling. Priority targets are a function, just to, just to reiterate, a function of the higher grade and the the large potential um, volume. Yes, yes. It's not not much point finding a, a high grade pegmatite if it's only a meter wide. So um, width and volume potential are two of the key categories that we need to be uh, searching for. And equally, there's not much find, um, point in finding a huge one if the grade's very low. So correct. That's right. So it's a combination of those two things, Merlin. Um, good. And you've got you've got plenty of those targets. Um, the 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 height, the high, width, length, breadth, plus grade to go for. Yep, absolutely, we sure do. We've got uh, an, a a large number. And, um, it's hard to put it in words, uh, in numbers specifically, but um, in terms of uh, zones or corridors of that contain multiple pegmatites. We've got uh, uh, 17 or 18 of those have been identified so far. And these corridors are all in the order of sort of one to three kilometres long. They contain multiple pegmatites. They all have outcropping spodumene mineralisation within them. So the, the potential for Andover to host an enormous deposit by world scale is very high. And that is essentially what you're seeing in the share price response. I mean, the, the, it's it, breadth of intersection with the grades you've been achieving, plus the kind of the geometry of the pegmatites um, is, is what is kind of attracting the market's attention. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and I, to my knowledge, don't know of any other uh, hard rock lithium projects in Western Australia that have been achieving multiple 100 metre plus intersections of mineralisation. Um, certainly, when we were very surprised and very pleased to see the high grades we got in the surface exploration, the rock chip sampling, um, with you know getting multiple three, four, up to five percent lithium grades at surface. But now to be getting um, over 100 metres of true width of uh, mineralisation in, inside these pegmatites is out- astounding. And as I say, I don't know of any others um, in Western Australia that can claim that. Good. Well, onwards and upwards. Get those um, the drill rigs, um, new drill rigs turning, and keep the existing ones turning. It's not all good news in Western Australia. Uh, you've got this um, pretty uh, obscure. Well, not obscure. I mean, it's high profile, but no one really knows what's going to happen. This heritage uh, law that's coming through. I think in a, in in ten days or something, the first of July. What, what what do you know about that? And, and what what's what is your company doing i mean what's western australia doing about it perhaps in general terms it is a new law that is true it's coming in on the 1st of july it's the aboriginal heritage protection act the thing that we don't understand or the thing the thing is that we don't understand what a lot of the processes are going to be we have a new law that is coming in that has not really been explained to any of the parties that are involved and that's not just mining companies and exploration companies but but farmers and and local traditional owner organisations and the like. So 
what we're going to have to do that's different from what we're already doing, we don't know. Um, we, Azure Minerals, has a heritage protection agreement in place with the local Nalama Aboriginal Corporation who represent the, the Nalama traditional owners of the land on which we operate. Um, and we have this heritage protection agreement in place which governs how we do our work and it's, it's very strict and uh, has the p protocols that we have to uh, abide by are very strict and uh, I'm just hopeful that that is sufficient to meet the, the, um, the new act. Uh, as I understand it, the, the, there are kind of various levels of um, penetration to the soil that need to be have different um, thresholds of, kind of um, agreements that are passed if you're doing kind of just surface stuff, if you're going down to 50 centimetres or deeper than that. Um, and th there's also some provision for kind of spiritual er areas of spiritual interest, which can change over time. Yes, they have those things and a whole lot more in there. Um, I think the uh, the consultants in this industry are going to be extremely busy in the, in the next little while. Uh, I think it's certainly going to slow down a lot of the activities that uh, companies and farmers uh, wish to undertake. Um, I just hope that it doesn't slow us right down to a dead stop. But we will have to see because, as I said, we don't really understand it. We'll be taking advice from the the people who specialise in this area legally and also the, the people who specialise in this area through anthropology or archaeology consultancies. Where did this um, stem from? Is it a Western Australian law or is, it, or is it kind of a federal law from, did it come from Canberra or? It's, it stems, stems directly, it's a West Australian law and it stems directly from uh, the Duke and Gorge caves that were blown up two or three years ago. So we've all got to thank. And that, and it is, it is, the, it is the government's response to that unfortunate incident. So the, the, the Rio Tinto, the Rio Tinto Heritage Protection <laughs> Act. Um, yes. Sorry, that's, that's a, 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 probably a bit unfair. <laughs> or maybe not. One of the things I was impressed with when we spoke last was the, the infrastructure. And do you think that's, uh, obviously it play, played, played a key part, but uh, in, in getting SQM interested in the project, but I think it's kind of first geology and second um, access to market, isn't it? Or, or d I mean, did they talk to you about how important that infrastructure element was? Uh, I think that they just recognised it as well as we did, is that uh, it's a absolutely first-class location as far as infrastructure goes. There's a heavy industrial area. There's you know, power lines, water pipelines, gas pipelines, railway lines, you know, everything you could possibly want to uh, uh, to get your product from the mine to the market. There's a there's a commercial th uh, in commercial port there at Dampier, which is can be used by anyone. Um, so all of those things are really add to the attractiveness of the project. Um, the two are, two of the three biggest um, lithium mines in Western Australia, Pilgrim Minerals, one at Pilgrim Gora and Minres with Wajina, they are, they're a long way out into the countryside. You know, they're several hundred meter, several hundred kilometres inland from the coast, um, and yet and they are obviously highly successful mines and and highly successful operations, producing vast uh, income streams for those two companies. Ours is sitting five kilometres from the coast, 30 kilometres from a port. So it's, it's surely, if we can find ourselves a big deposit, then that that gives us a huge advantage. Obviously, the share price has has gone up five times this year. It's just been a huge success, um, you know, from 25 cents or 22 cents up to $1.25. What's the feedback? I mean, how, what's the dialogue I mean, I, with, with your major shareholders? I mean, we've spoken about SQM. Um, Creasy is a major shareholder, isn't the Creasy group um, kind of thirteen percent or so? Yes, that's right. And and then there's a German group, Deutsche Balaton and Delphi, which have another twelve percent. I mean, a any other commentary other than um, good stuff? Keep going. Oh, congr <laughs> congratulations with bells and whistles, things like that. Um, I think that uh, you'd have to say that both of them are extremely happy because Creasy's shareholding came from shares that we. We, with which we acquired the Andover project back in 2020. So we issued him uh, 50 million shares to to buy the project. or And so his 50 million shares, in effect, are free carried for him. And you know, the current share price at $1.25, you know, theoretically, he's done very well out of that deal. And just on the, on the, um, the shares themselves... Don't, don't forget, he also, uh, it's a 60-40 joint venture. We own the 60%, but his, he owns 40%, and that's free carried through to the, 
the decision to mine. So he's doing well both in terms of his direct shareholding in Azure, plus the value of his 40% of the project is, is escalating quickly as well. And any commentary on the, what he wants to do with that 40% or is it just, what What did he originally say about it and what's the plan now? Um, I, I, I can't really, don't really want to speak for him, but he has expressed interest uh, at various times in both um, rolling his project share into Azure um, and alter- or as an alternative, holding on to his 40% and, and basically seeing it all the way through to becoming a mining operation of which he has a, is a 40% shareholder. And I think everything in between. So he's a he's a he's an individual who has uh, very strong views as to uh, what's best for him and his organisation. And presumably, yeah, well, we, we can't really speak for them, but I mean, they're experienced in the mining sector, I mean, hugely experienced. And so they've, prob- they've done a, a range of exits from everything from participating through to... Um, uh, outright sale. Correct. Yeah, that's it. And uh, and our uh, German shareholders, who own about just over twelve percent of the company, have been with us for more than six years now. Um, they initially invested in us on the back of a silver discovery that we made in Mexico, uh, and so the uh, they've they've been a long term shareholder. Um, I think they would, uh, well, at least I've, in the messages I've received from the CEO, uh, he's extremely happy and excited by what's happening. So. Uh, and good on them as well, because they'll do very well out of it. Yeah, that's good. And, uh, do you get any inbound from any other um, institutions or any in, um, any other corporates? You know, what, what, Has the telephone rung at all? It has a lot, especially in the last couple of weeks since we started putting out those uh, the drill results. You know, 100 metres at uh, 1.2% lithium. Uh, it's certainly sparked the interest of a lot of the uh, the players in the industry. And and yes, I am fielding phone calls. You, you mentioned from industry, but um, from from the investment side, do you, are you getting anybody saying um, that when you when you need to raise capital, give us a call, we'll, we could um, we could help out? Yes, most definitely. That that side is very popular at the moment. I'm getting a lot of uh, phone calls, text messages, emails from people that are expressing interest in helping me raise some more money. But with we've got twenty million dollars in the bank at the moment, and we don't really need to do that in the short term. Exploration companies always need to raise money at some point in the future. Um, is that something that you will address in a different calendar year? I, I suspect it'll be sooner than that. Um, but we, we certainly don't have any plans at the moment for doing a raising. All, all exploration companies always need to look ahead to raising capital, and there has to be a balance between equity dilution and the ability to to plan ahead and execute your goals. So if you're doing a, effectively what you're doing now is a big drill out to find an exploration target, to define exploration targets. And so beyond that, you're going to have another, um, your, 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 the next phase of advancement of the project is to take it through that resource definition and the, kind of the technical and economic studies. Really, I mean, that, that's basically what you will need future money for, isn't right. it? We will need future money. I mean, we, as I said, we've still got $20 million in the bank with six drill rigs operating. You know, we're spending 3 to $4 million a month. So it will go quite quickly, but yes, so this, yes, there will be a need at some stage, but we don't have any plans to do it right at the moment. Um, we are getting uh, a lot of very good results that have come through uh, and been released. We, we'll have more good results coming through, which will be released in, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to say weekly, but certainly very frequently. And when when those all those results are into the market, the market's more fully informed as to the potential of the project. And, uh, and on the back of that, we can then go and... Um, uh, with a steady state share price, you know, that's that's not volatile, it's not up and down like a yo-yo, uh, then we will be able to raise money at a, at a at a fair value. Yeah, good. Tony, thanks so much for the update. Um, good luck with it all. Thanks, Merlin. It's an absolute pleasure to talk about a really good story. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> a, rare, a rare occurrence in the resources sector, you know, when, it kind of thing, when a plan comes together and the market um, 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 salutes the... the, the, the salutes the flag that's been um, raised yeah absolutely it's it's good fun